flange, a bolted flange with bolts going through there. Same thing. What force must, must the bolts have to hold us in place? That's a big question. What, this is a big steam pipe on a power plant, nuclear power plant. What is, the, what is the force in the bolts to hold this thing in place? Oh, yeah, very important. Very important. Once you find the force, you divide it by the bolt area that gives you the bolt stress, and now you pick a bolt out with the right stress, factor safety. All these things are coupled together, you know, when you're building things. <coughs> okay, so, and we'll come back to that now. 536, 539, we'll do 550 next. But I want to finish up the last part of chapter 6 first. Okay. Uh, Rewind, and uh, we had uh, talked about in chapter six, we derived the continuity equation. We derived the differential form of the continuity equation. Okay, there's, there's the only other equation in chapter six, which goes through a derivation, uh, is going to lead us to, um, it's really linear momentum, linear momentum equation in differential form. We start off with a, with a, a differential, system of mass delta m. So a differential system of mass delta m. Now here's the flow field. And we take a little differential system of mass delta m and we watch it as it moves through the flow field. Now let us first of all apply Newton's law to it. The summation of the forces, this is differential forces. Differential forces on that little element of mass is the time rate of change. Look at the big D, okay? the big D, okay, material derivative of <coughs> velocity times delta M. What's this momentum? <coughs> momentum mass times velocity. The forces on the object, the time rate of change of momentum that the object has. Okay, it, it can be considered to be second law <coughs> because if you replace, pull the mass outside the, the, the uh, material derivative, pull the mass outside, why can you do that? Well, don't forget, a system has a constant mass. So if mass is a constant, pull the mass outside the derivative. Then we have delta M times capital D V D T. Now we've defined capital D V D T previously as the acceleration. Looks like Newton's law, F equal M A. That's why I set up here, Newton's law. F equal M A. Where did it come from? A change in momentum caused by the forces acting on the differential mass delta M. These forces on the left-hand side can be what we call body forces. <coughs> that means they're distributed throughout the body uniformly. Typically the weight, the weight is a body force. And the forces on the surface of that little differential mass delta M. Surface forces can be pressure, and what's pressure? A normal stress, and if there's friction, what are those guys called? Shearing stresses. So the forces on the surface can, uh, can be either uh, normal stress, like pressure, or forces like shearing stresses that act on the sides of this little object right here. So those guys there can be put together in the equation, and we know what the capital DM DT is, we had that DV, uh, capital DV DT, we had that previously. And so if we do that, so this gives uh, rho GX partial with respect to X, sigma XX, shear stress partial tau yx with respect to y, shear stress tau zx with respect to z plus rho, we had this before, D, V, D, T. 
That was in chapter, I think, four. What's on the left-hand side? The forces. What kind of forces? Uh, anytime you got gravity and mass, rho is mass, that's gravity, that's the weight. That's not the weight. This guy right here, sigma, is a compressive stress. That's the pressure. This guy right here, a shearing stress. On the top and bottom. This guy right here, a shearing stress. On the front and back sides. All those subscripts mean something. You know that if you took ME218 strength materials, you know what those subscripts mean. <clears throat> the first one means the shearing stress acts on a surface perpendicular to the y direction. And it acts in a direction in the, in the x direction. So one subscript tells you what surface it acts on. The other one tells you what direction it acts in. That's the double subscript. The normal stress sigma acts in a plane perpendicular to the x direction. That's the x direction. My hand is the plane. Second subscript acts in the x direction. Yeah, there it is. First, first subscript acts in a plane normal to the x direction. My hand. Second subscript, it acts in a direction, x direction, that way. That tells us how the stresses act on each surface. So, and then, I'm not going to write them all out. There's one for y, and there's one for uh, z. Three equations. One the x direction, one the y direction, one the z direction. They're equations 650 in the textbook. Uh, these are called <clears throat> the general differential equations of motion. There's three, one x direction, one y, one z. <clears throat> okay, I see anything else on that right now? I don't think so. Okay. Now, uh, we're gonna make some assumptions. Number one assumption. If the flow is inviscid. Don't forget the word inviscid means frictionless. <clears throat> or non viscous. They're all the same thing in our nomenclature. If it's if there's no friction all these shear stress guys are going to go. Everything with the shear stress goes. So we're left with then Where you replace the sigma xx, which is a normal stress, and what's pressure? Pressure is a compressive normal stress. What's compressive mean? It's a negative sign on sigma. A compressive stress is a negative sign. So the, compre the, the stress on the x face is compressive. That's what the minus means. And it's called the pressure. So in a fluid, 
like that. That's what we have. If it's in viscid, no, it has to be in viscid. Okay. Um, there's three of these guys, of course. There's one X direction, there's one Y direction, there's one Z direction. Uh, C equations. Uh, these guys are 651. Okay, so these are called Euler's equations of motion. easy to solve there, you know, it takes a little bit of, of math for some simple geometries and some simple approaches. So yeah. Uh, by the way, when you solve these guys, uh, what you're doing is you're solving for, look over here what you've got, pressure may not be known, little u, <coughs> little v, little w. Solve for little u, little v, little w, and pressure. How many equations of the Euler's equations of motion? One in the x, one in the y, one in the z, that's three. How many unknowns? Four. I need one more. Guess what we did in chapter six, first, first part of the chapter? Continuity, you got it. Continuity and the three others, four equations, four unknowns. It could be solved. It could be solved. It might be difficult, but it could be solved. Okay. Um, oh, uh, by the way, as a function of, look at the variables, time, x, y, z. <coughs> So, you can solve for the pressure as a function of time, x, y, and z. You can solve for the x component of the velocity as a function of time, x, y, and z, and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, you can also reduce this down. Uh, they can be, well, let's just say, it can be reduced to the Bernoulli equation. It can be reduced to the Bernoulli equation. It's very, very similar to Bernoulli equation in, the, in the one dimension. In Bernoulli's, uh, is there a z term? Yeah, g tells you how G is a function of how far up and down you are vertically. There's a pressure term, that's in Bernoulli's. If it's only a function of x, get rid of the y and z. If it's steady state, get rid of the t function. This guy here, what's this guy here? Partial u squared with respect to x. Okay, one half. Okay, so. That's 2u, 2u divided by 2 du dx. Those guys are the same. Does that look like Bernoulli's? Of course it does. V squared divided by what? Guess what's divided by 2. Yeah, you can reduce it down to Bernoulli's. Some people that teach the course derive Bernoulli's this way. We derive Bernoulli's back in week three just to kind of get a flavor for energy in the fluid mechanics. But you can derive Bernoulli's and back in chapter three, we derived Bernoulli's along a streamline and a little fluid element along a streamline. Remember, we took a little fluid element along a streamline and we derived Bernoulli's equation from that. 
Some people don't cover that in chapter 3, and they do the same thing in chapter 6. They stop here, and now they derive Bernoulli's, uh, and our textbook goes through it again. He says, you want to see us derive Bernoulli's? Read that page in the textbook. And they derive Bernoulli's from this, and they end up with the same Bernoulli we had back in chapter 3. Okay, now, one more step. Uh, now, this is frictionless. Now, consider friction. <coughs> Okay, uh, it can be shown. That. Those are all in the equation 6, 1, 25. Um, they're sometimes called the constitutive equations. They uh, relate the stress terms to the velocity field and the pressure and the viscosity. And the textbook says, uh, if you want to see how, where they came from, here's three references. Go find them and read it. In other words, it's pretty tough stuff. It's not, it's not something you want to put in an undergraduate textbook. Okay. So you have to say, okay, I believe it. Um, there they are. That's what they are. So you take those guys there, and wherever you see these guys up here, for sigma xx, you put this one. Tau xy, you put this one. Tau yx, this one. And so on and so forth. You sub stuff in. But it's complicated. Okay. When you're done, you get equations like this. center in the, X, in the y direction and the z direction. Three of them. X direction, y direction, z direction. Uh, C equations 6, 1, 27. <coughs> These guys are e even worse. These guys now are nonlinear, second order, partial differential equations. Second order, partial differential equations. Oh yeah. That's for the advanced group, okay? Yeah, those, those guys, because they include viscosity. Uh -huh. Oilers do not include viscosity. The ones that work all the time are the general differential equations of motion. If you neglect viscosity, you get these guys. If you include viscosity, you get these guys. These guys are called the Navier-Stokes equations. three equations on the board. The general equations of motion of a fluid in a, in a fluid field. The equations which are um, inviscid, which are, end up with called Euler's equations of motions. And if you include viscosity, you end up with what's called the Navier-Stokes equations. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know now, if you finish, typically you civil engineers and MEs take two quarters of fluids, okay. But if this is going to be your area of interest, 
and you want to get a master's degree, let's say, here at Cal Poly, you would first of all, in the master's program, take advanced fluids, EGR 535, advanced fluids, four unit class, one quarter. Then if you want to go further, you would take potential flow, four unit class, in the graduate program. <coughs> potential flow neglects viscosity, okay? And then, if you want to look at these guys, you take a course called Boundary Layer Theory, which talks about the boundary layers on objects, between an object and a fluid, like an airfoil or a turbine blade. You take a course which focuses on these guys. So, there's at least three graduate courses worth four units each, 12 units of graduate, of graduate work, okay, in advanced fluids. And what do we do on this thing here? Probably about 12 to 15 minutes which is, you know, a little scratch like that. Nothing, nothing, it's just advanced stuff. It's heavy stuff. Okay, we got our own problems, okay. So anyway, just so you know, that's, that's what you get into if you're interested in, in fluid mechanics, thermal sciences. You get into the equations like that. They're called field equations. They apply at every point in a field. They're not a controlled volume approach. There's no control surfaces. You solve for the velocities and the pressure as a function of time, x, y, and z. Analytically, if you can, which you many times can. Numerically, if you can, many times you can. Okay. That's where numerical methods comes in, courses like that. Okay, so I just want to give you a flavor of that so you know what those words mean. If somebody throws out the word knob or stoke, you say, who's that guy? No, no, it's not, it's not a guy's name, okay? Two guys' names. Uh, they're, they're, they're advanced, and the key thing is to know when they apply. Friction, considering friction, Euler's, frictionless, these guys, that's why they're called general. You start here and you drive these two guys from now. And the textbook takes about eight pages for that stuff. Eight pages. We don't have time in a quarter course. Okay, now let's go back. Since we did that, let's go back to our problems we were working. And you've got four problems for homework in chapter, in chapter um, six, right? That homework will now be due with the chapter five homework on Monday. So add the chapter six homework to the chapter five homework that was due anyway on Monday. Okay, we're going through the problems I assigned for homework in chapter five, talking about the energy equation. We discussed two of them already. We passed the homework back. It's over there if you missed it. We talked about 36 and 39, so we'll quickly look at 50, if I think it has something that's important. Let me just look at it real quick. 650, well, maybe, probably not, but I'll do it anyway. Um, oh yeah, we will. 6, 5, Okay, I'll uh, read it. The nozzle is attached to a vertical pipe, discharges water to the atmosphere. All these are major hints. Discharge, we know Q. We know the pressure at the flange. So discharging, we know Q. We know the pressure at the flange. We know Q. Pressure here, we know, zero. She said atmosphere. Those are all hints. Determine the vertical <coughs> component of the anchoring force required to hold the nozzle in place. The nozzle has a weight of 200 newtons and the volume of water in the nozzle is 0.012. Is the anchoring force upward or down? Okay, so again, we always, we always show our points. Draw your control, control volume. Okay, control surface. Call this one, call this two. Okay, now, but you know, we gotta be careful now because there is a weight acting down of the nozzle and there's a weight acting down of the water. Okay, you gotta include those two guys in there. 
And now you might say, well, I'm going to assume that the force here is uh, positive to make it easy in my equation. There's my Fy. So, and my X and Y, like this. Left-hand side of momentum, plus Fy minus weight of nozzle minus weight of the water, plus the pressure force up here in the Y direction, zero, zero. Equal the change in momentum. I'm not going to go through it again, but you know, rho V times V dot A at one, rho V times V dot A at two. You you know the you know the Q. You know V times A. It's given. He gives you the areas A1 and A2. Done deal. Plug them in, crank it out, you got it. And as I told you, you know, when you're studying for exams, don't stop there. What if I ask you to find the force in the uh, x direction? You know? <coughs> Think about that one. Yeah. That's a y direction, but in, in the x direction, what's the pressure on the top there? Zero. You know, so what's that going to tell you? you? You got momentum leading, but what, what's the velocity? You know, the velocity leading there is, is that. All it's going to be is rho q times v. That's the easy one. All right, let's go to 561. 561. Oh, yeah, okay. 561. It's like this. Stuff comes in. It's going to go out two locations now. One location is it goes up and back, turns around and back. And the other location down here, like this, out, out, in. Control volume, control surface inside. Pressure we know, velocity we know, velocity we know, okay, they call this one, we know V1, call this 2, we're given V2, call this 3, we don't know V3, we weren't given V3, we know P1, and here's a, here's a key thing, water discharges into the atmosphere, thank you very much, P3 is 0, P2 is zero. He told me it discharged the atmosphere. And I know P1. I know P1, I know V1, I know V2. Continuity gives V3. Momentum gives the force in the X direction. <coughs> Just so you know how to solve for B3, continuity. B times A, B1, A1, equal B2, A2, plus V3, A3. The only unknown is B3, solve for it. Okay, let's go on. Professor? Yeah. Mm -hmm. horizontal circular jet of air, air, okay, strikes a stationary flat plate as indicated. The jet velocity is 40 meters per second. The jet diameter is 30. If the air velocity magnitude remains constant over the, as the air flows over the plate surface in the direction shown, determine the magnitude of F. 
the anchoring force required to hold the plate stationary, and then do a part B and then part C. That's air, air now, okay? Horizontal, circular jet of air. Horizontal tells you don't worry about the delta Z's. Don't worry about Z1 and Z2 and Z3. He's nice, he labels 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0.3. So, so this thing, is, here's my horizontal jet of air, and it, it hits this thing. See, here, here it is right here. Here's a horizontal jet of air. The jet of air hits this. He's saying some goes up, some goes down. Well, that's how it looks, okay? Um, it's something like the one we worked before where the jet of water hit the vertical plate. It's on the ground. The jet of water hits here and it spreads out in all directions uniformly, except now the plate is air now. The plate's like this and it hits here and goes up that way and down that. He tells you V1, V2, and V3, I guess. But, but the key of that problem, to make life easier, to find your um, coordinate system this way. And then uh, momentum in the y direction gives the force F. So it, change your coordinate system to make life easy for yourself. Well, let's put the extra extra gets up. There's, there's no momentum in the Y. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the key. That's the key. That's part C, I think. Maybe. In, the, in, the, in the X direction, okay, you're going to find out it's zero, which tells you there is no force in the X direction, which means it's frictionless oh. flow. It's oh, okay. frictionless flow, part C. It's frictionless flow, okay? Okay, um, let's, I think that was the last one. Yeah, that was the last one, moment, momentum. Let's, let's do the energy one. Um, good, yeah, time. All right, 102, 5102. diameter going down to a small diameter, yeah. And we've got the flow going down. The problem says it flows down. Uh, vertical, vertical pipe now, so you like account for Z's. Mercury manometer, okay, got a manometer from here down to here. <clears throat> we have, this is, he says oil, not oil, not water, so oil. And this guy goes down there and comes up. H. So down here comes up to here. This distance is H. And that's gamma of mercury. Yeah. And it's 0.6 meters from here to here. I'm going to call this location one, and I'll call this location two, okay? And I'm going to write energy one to two. Um, I think I'm gonna write it P1 over gamma plus V1 squared over 2G 
plus Z1 P2 over gamma plus V2 squared over 2G plus Z2. Let's see what we'll find here now. Determine the volumetric flow rate <coughs> for frictionless flow. Okay, so I put the loss as zero in there. Because he said frictionless flow, put the loss term in the energy equation as zero. There is no pump, HP is zero. There is no turbine, HT is zero. There is no losses, HL, HL <coughs> losses. In what? Feet or meters. What's this in? Feet or meters. What's that in? Feet or meters. What's that in? Feet or meters. Everything in there is in feet or meters. Okay, the reason why I sign this is because I don't want to just start, I know the testimony, but the final exam is two weeks later. Okay, good news, I'm sure. Yeah, you, you have to go back and review manometers again from back in week two. You know, might as well do it now. That way there's less to study for for the final. So, um, let's keep reading there and see. We're supposed to find Q. Of course, Q1 equals Q2, so don't even call it Q1. I know they're both the same. Why? Steady flow, incompressible. Okay. Um, can I find P1 minus P2? Of course I can. Manometer, chapter 2. Can I find V1 in terms of E2? Of course, V1, A1 equal V2, A2. Got it. Can I find Z1 minus Z2? Oh, of course, 0.6. What are you going to solve for? I don't know, V1 or V2, take your choice. Once you get V1, what do you multiply it by? A1 to get what? Q. End of problem. But he's not, he's not going to be super kind to you. He's not going to tell you that you're supposed to call this distance here x. It's not on the sketch, but he hopes you realize it. Because if you don't, you say, I think he made a mistake. He didn't put it to me. I think he meant to, I think he meant to put to put this thing up to there. Oh no, he didn't. No, not way up there. No. Well, you know, you don't have to do that if you just realize. If you go down in water, that distance x on the left hand side, going down means what? plus gamma x. And you go up on this side, going up means what? Minus sign, gamma times x. Plus gamma times x of oil. Minus gamma times x of oil. Cancels out, it's gone, x disappears. But it's nice to know why it disappears. Well, you know, that, that's the point there was, you should put an x there when you do the problem so that I know that you know what you're doing. That's the point. Okay, now let's take the next one. Uh, 102, we're going to go to uh, 105, I guess. 105. <coughs> yeah, 105. All right, 105, we have a siphon in a tank. And I guess this is water, we'll see. Yeah, water, okay. We know the diameter given. Uh, we know all the distances from here. Let's put it down further, it's showing down here. So here to here to here. We know the distance from <coughs> here to here. Those are all known. Check, check, check. We know it's water. Gamma, water. Got it. Well, the friction loss is 0.8 V squared divided by 2. Okay, we're supposed to find the flow rate. Okay, which means find the velocity. What velocity? 
the velocity in the pipe. Okay, so we start off and say, you know what, I'm going to call this point one, and I'm going to call that point two. Okay, got it. Uh, let's go ahead and write the energy equation down. no pump, there's no turbine, zero, zero. Pick out the right equation. I put three on the board for you. I said sometimes it's easier to use one equation than it is the other equation. Which equation am I going to pick now? Well, here I'll tell you which one. What did he give me? He gave me the losses in terms of what? B squared or 2G? No. That'd be the third equation. B squared two, it's called the head equation. No. He gave me the loss in terms of B squared over 2. I try and find in those three equations a B squared over 2 sitting all by itself. Oh, there it is right there. The second equation down, the middle one. So I put the middle one here. Why? Because then I'm going to get rid of the losses and I better have, what's the units here? What's the units here? What's the units here? <clears throat> What's the units here? Believe well, you can drive it. This guy better have the same units that those guys have. Okay. All I do then is I put him right here. Now again, just so you know, there are three velocities, V1, V2, and V. They're all different, generally. V1 is a velocity at point one on the control surface. If it's, if you draw one. V2, the velocity at point two. And V, the velocity in the pipe. And up Yeah, um, so uh, on the uh, midterm problem that you posted online uh, for the energy, you gave us the losses had a, like, as a coefficient. So what, when you give us the coefficient, what is it usually in terms of that B squared over 2? Coefficients like, uh, let, let's say, P sub 2. That's the coefficient 2. Do you really mean coefficient? A subscript? Or you mean something in front of something? Yeah, like. Give, give me an example. What was it? Uh, it was like, it, it gave the. Um, the uh, lo the coefficient of uh, losses due to the piping of the tube is 0 0.4. Okay, I don't recall that. I'll look at it. Yeah. Do you have it uh, somewhere I can look at afterwards? Yeah. Online or something? I'll look at it. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Normally it's given like that. Uh, I'll look at that more clearly and see. Okay, now we're supposed to find V. Uh, which V? That V. How about this guy? He's gone. Uh, this guy? He's gone. Uh, this guy, he's gone. Uh, Z1 minus Z2. Uh, I know it right here. Z2, Z1. This distance uh, minus that distance. Got it. Got it. Got it. What's V2? The velocity leaving the pipe. What's V? The velocity in the pipe. Are they the same? Of course, they have to be. Solve the equation for V. Once you get V, multiply it by the area of the pipe, pi d squared divided by 4. End of problem. You've got Q. But make sure you know what those V's are. There's a V1, there's a V2, and there's a V. Okay. On Monday, oh, hey, I'm telling you, think like I think. What if I ask you for the pressure here and the losses in the pipe up to that point A the losses in the pipe up to point A were 0.3 V per over 2. Okay, I'm not going to solve it. I'm just telling you how I think. What if I ask you for 
the pressure point B. Oh, I'm going to stop there. You get the point. Don't stop just and work the problem you're assigned. Use your mind to think that. What could the instructor ask me by tweaking the problem a little bit? Yeah, I'm interested. Up here, maybe the, the, the water's going to vaporize. And stop, stop the siphon. That's what I'm worried about. The vapor pressure of water up there. And when, how about the entrance here? Is the pressure just gamma times that distance? Oh, no. No. No, because of, there's a velocity there. What's that velocity? V. Okay. So if I, I, I can go from 1 to B, or I can go from 1 to A, or from B to A. So be thinking about things like that, too. All right, let's go on. That was 105. Now let's go to 114. Professor, uh -huh. so the question he was asking was the last coefficient for the packing is k equals 0 0.4. Uh, say it again, John. The last one? The last coefficient for the piping is k equals 0 0.4. On this problem, the border. No, the no, one that you're not going to say. Oh, k equal again, not k. k equals 0 0.4. Okay, that's all it says? The last coefficient for the piping is k equals 0 0.4. Determine okay. the power output of a turbine. All right, and typically that's the coefficient in front of the v squared over 2g term. Okay. The coefficient in front of the v. I, I would be more specific next time I tell you that because okay. you couldn't tell from that and you couldn't tell from that. I would put it like this to make sure there's no there's no error so in the interpretation. And this would be 0 0.8? Yeah, I would put 0 0.4 V square root 2G probably. Because normally it's specified as feet, feet loss, yeah. That's a good point. Thanks for finding for us. Okay, uh, 114. Alright, this is about Kevin Pumpkin. Uh, let's just look at that real quick. 114. Oh the, the fire truck, okay. Uh, let's see, the pressure's there, the diameter's there. So we have this uh, fire truck with a pump here. And the water comes in and then it goes out here. Here's the uh, fire hose. And then the water goes up here. <coughs> fire hose. And uh, the pumper truck showing delivers, he, she was given. 60 feet given, so we have Q, uh, Q, we have 60 feet, uh, let's see what else we know about the pump, the pressure, uh, we know the pressure and uh, we know the uh, diameter outlet of the hydrant is 10, the head losses in the pipe are negligibly small, determine the power uh, that the pump provides. So find W dot pump. Okay, let's write down the energy equation. Leave HP in, that's the pump head. And write the equation in terms of head, at least I'll do it that way. I, I prefer that one. But you, if you want to use the one that has the power in it directly, you can do that too. <clears throat> I'm going to leave it like this though. It is equal to P2 gamma V2 squared over 2G plus Z2. Uh, let's see. Find. Um, Neglect the losses. Yeah, and go ahead and find uh, the uh, power. Okay. Um, P1, yes, uh, I know it. V1, okay. Z1, I'll call it zero. Z2 is 60. V2, I don't know. I don't know that guy there. Leave him in there. Um, yeah, yes, I do. P2 is atmospheric, zero. This point two, so you know where point two is. Uh, and let's see what we've got there. Yeah, we know Q, so we know Q, so we get V1 equal Q over A. I know that. Q is given. Solve for HP. 
then w dot power of the pump equal gamma q h p divided by I want to let's, let's do it like that. If you want it in uh, horsepower divided by 550, if it's in British gravitational, otherwise it comes out to be in uh, kilowatt, uh, kilowatts. Okay. Uh, is it okay if we leave it in pound foot per second, or which is uh, we prefer if it's in horsepower? It will save the problem. Find the power in horsepower oh, okay. or find the power in kilowatts. I'll okay. be specific. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, 5, 1, 16. Uh, okay. Again, you know, I can tweak this problem and tell you the losses in the hose are 0.8 B square 2. You can just add stuff like that, you know. It doesn't change the problem much, you know. I can say if the <coughs> pump efficiency is 80%, how much power must be provided to the pump? Because I'll tell you, this power I get out of here is the power that the pump blades provide to the water. Well, what's the power required to rotate the pump blades in a centrifugal pump? Okay, you gotta divide that guy by the efficiency. The equations are in your notes, the efficiency equations. They're in your notes, so I can put efficiency in there. I can put losses in there. Those are the things I can do to that same problem assigned for homework. Okay, 5116. Now we've got a, a reservoir with a pump pumping to uh, another reservoir on top of this reservoir. It's open to the atmosphere. <clears throat> and we take water out of here and it goes through a pump. Then it goes up into a second reservoir which um, has its capped on top has air up there at two atmospheres. So we know the pressure up there. So here is the water, and it's capped on top. This is air, and this is water. Okay, so we know the flow rates that way. Uh, we're, let's see if we're giving now, to see how, what we know. Okay, we know the flow rate. <coughs> Gals, we know GPM. We know the Q, so we know Q. Uh, it adds three horsepower, so P10, B10, Z10. We got a pump. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll put a pump in here. It wouldn't work too good. Thanks. Uh, P2 is not, is not zero, it's two atmospheres. Okay, got it. B2, yeah, that's zero. Z2, got it. HP, I know what it is. It's right here. Okay, what, what, what's the. What's the power of so many kilowatts? Three horsepower. Oh, okay, three horsepower. Oh, now you got to play the 550 game. Okay, there's 550. <clears throat> I know this value, got it. I know gamma of water, got it. He gave me Q, he gave me Q, got it. Solve for HP, put HP there. Okay, now HP. I know it, check more. Now I solve for the losses. Okay, now, if I get the uh, losses positive, it's okay. If I get a negative, it's impossible. So that's what you do. You solve for the losses. If you get a positive sign, yeah, it can happen. If you get a negative sign, it can't happen. Losses can never be negative. Losses are always positive. They take energy out. Losses don't put energy into a fluid. They take energy out of a fluid. Okay, uh, I'm not gonna do 117. They give you everything you need. Let's see. 
Yeah, okay, good. by gravity from one side of a lake to another, from one lake to another lake, at a steady rate of 80. Good, we know Q. What is the loss of available energy associated with this, with this flow? And he gives us, he gives us delta Z. There's no pump. There's no turbine. P10, P20, V10, V20, Z150, Z20. There's only one thing left in the equation. Z2 equal losses. Okay, easy. We got it. Now comes the other side of the coin. Keep reading. Uh, now, if we want to reverse this flow and pump water up from the lower reservoir to the higher reservoir, estimate the pumping power required. So now I put a pump in here, and now I change the flow direction. Now, you better change the subscripts. If you don't, you're going to get really bad. This has to be one, because that's where the flow comes from. This has to be two. That's where the flow ends up. P10, Z10, V10, two, P20. V20, Z2, 50, Z2, 50. Here's the equation. HP equal zero, 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 equal zero, zero, plus 50, plus 50, 50 plus 50. Okay. Power? You want the power? H to P times gamma Q, H to P. That's the power. Okay, so one goes down by gravity. That's, that's how these pumping stations in the Sierra work sometimes. They let the water flow out of the lake down to a generator at a lower elevation during the day to generate electricity. Then when it's cheap to run electricity, they use electricity to pump the water back up the lake at night. It's called pump storage. And a lot, of, a lot of utilities use that because electricity at night is cheap because nobody has their lights on at night. So they pump the water back up to the upper lake in the Sierras at night, then let it run down the day to, to power the lights in Fresno, and blah, 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 and so on and so forth. So it happens. It happens all the time. That's why it's an important problem. OK, last one. We're going to finish on time. That's great. All right, 5, 131. Okay, let's look at this guy now. All right, 130, boy, that's the, that's the I gotta take my book and sketch him. This is a little, little bit different than we've done in the past. Looks like this.
All right, so we have water. Water, I think it's water. Yes, it is. Water flows steadily down. down, down. There is a manometer, so practice again from chapter two. Okay, like this, like this, like this, like this, like this. And we've got the fluid level here and here, and we know this distance from here to here. Check. We uh, know this is mercury. Gamma HG. We know this is water, gamma water. Um, the, the diameter's the same. The difference in the first part, it says, go back to chapter 2 and find P1 minus P2. There's one. There's two. Part A, find P1 minus P2. Chapter 2, I'm not going to go and do this. We've done it enough. Okay, part B, the loss between sections one and two. Okay, that's over there again. It's over there. Uh, is there a pump? No. Is there a turbine? No. Are there losses? Yes. Leave it in. Do I know P1 minus P2? Of course I do. I found that from part A. Conservation of mass. Q1 equal Q2. B1, A1 equal B2, A2. Same diameter. Conclusion. B2 equal B1. Okay. Cancel. Cancel. Difference in elevation. Uh, he tells us this is five. Five, uh, five feet. Okay. He tells us it's 30 degrees. Yeah, I got it. The vertical, the vertical part of that, okay. Five times the sine of thirty. I've, I've got uh, delta z. Uh, matter of fact, I'm going to call z two zero. My choice. I call it zero. You all solve for z one. Five sine thirty. Uh, that's it. Solve for losses. Part B. Okay, done. Got that. I got that. Now let's do part C. Uh, okay. Here's my control line. Find the friction loss in the pipe. comes in, area vector points out, dot product, dot, I'm writing it this way, okay, 
in the x direction. That's what I want. I want the force due to friction in the x direction, called the axial direction. Okay, dot product, out, area vector out, velocity vector in, minus, dot product, area vector out, velocity vector out, positive, velocity here, v1, velocity there, v2, okay, this sign negative, that sign positive. Uh, let's see here. Okay, we got that guy. And then we've got uh, V2, rho 2, A2, V2. Uh, force in the x direction. Uh, for, of course, the friction force. Which way do you want to assume friction at? acts? Well, you know, most folks believe friction acts against the flow. Of course it does. So I'm probably going to put a minus F. My intuition tells me that's the way it goes. It acts against the flow. It tends to slow the flow down. Pressure force here. Don't try and get, I told you, don't try and do too much on one picture. <clears throat> Three forces, there they are. Don't try and muddle your mind and put too much stuff on one diagram. You're asking for trouble. I guarantee it. P1, the force due to pressure, force due to pressure P1. P1A1, positive. P2, minus P2A2. The weight, the actual weight times the sine of 30 acting in the axial direction. The weight times the weight of what? The weight of what? Don't include the pipe. Look at my dashed lines. Did my dashed lines include the pipe wall? No. They only included the water. They didn't include the pipe wall. There is an identical problem of this. It's a long problem. It's the longest problem in chapter five. It starts on page 216, it goes through page 217, and it ends up on page 218. And on page 218, they draw a nozzle with just the water showing. So the example we're going to follow is on page 218. It's example 511. <clears throat> That's what you need to do to follow, to do what I did on this problem right here. Okay, this is, a, this is an interesting problem. It's a great review problem. You know, Chapter, we, we go to chapter uh, two for part, for part A. We, we go to chapter five uh, on energy for part B. And we go into chapter five for momentum on part C. Oh yeah, it gets you ready for, for an exam. Yeah, it will. Okay, good stopping point, so we'll see you then.